Hello everyone and welcome to the Cardano Effect. In tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about Cardano 101. We're going to be going over some of the basics, uh, just so you guys are aware. In the earlier episodes of Cardano is when we really need to touch on the basics of Cardano and cryptocurrencies and how they work. Uh, because, you know, maybe a year from now or two years from now when people are going to look back at the Cardano Effect and check out our episodes... Uh, you're going to have new people coming into the space. There'll be thousands of new people entering the space a year from now. And you old timers out there, you can point them back to the earlier episodes of the Cardano Effect so that they know where to go look so they can find information related to cryptocurrencies and uh, to Cardano itself. You can say, hey guys, start here. There's a good starting place. And in as the episodes go along, we're going to get more and more advanced. Coming up in a couple of weeks, we'll be going to Plutus Fest and where we're going to get some very advanced episodes out of that. So to give you an idea of what we'll be going over this evening, we're going to touch on uh, basically some of the original Cardano philosophies that you can find on Cardano Docs under Introduction. There's a good document there. Tonight's discussion and dialogue is going to kind of follow along in that context, but the context of Cardano Docs was written more towards uh, developers and investors and people in the financial industry who want to learn more about Cardano. We're going to boil it down a little simpler. That's what we do with the Cardano effect. We want to make uh, cryptocurrency and uh, easier to understand and take it from the theoretical to the practical so that uh, the common person has a better understanding. That's really how I understand it as well. Some of the things we're going to cover tonight are what are the pros and cons of uh, fiat versus crypto in a practical sense? Uh, why do we care? What is the biggest difference between proof of work and proof of stake? Uh, what is the difference between Cardano SL and CO? What's the difference between like a light client and a thick client? Um, and a full node, and a light node, and a web browser node. So those are things we're going to be going over tonight. And uh, before we start going into the details, I would like to introduce my fellow co-hosts, Sebastian and Philippe. Uh, starting with Sebastian, we have him reporting in from Japan. I say he's kind of coming back from the future because tomorrow, uh, we're, we're recording on Saturday night, and it's already Sunday in Japan. So Sebastian, uh, say hi to the audience, and welcome from the future. Yeah, hey everyone. It's nice to be on the podcast as always. I think we have a really exciting discussion today, so I'm excited to kind of get into it and go through all the details of Cardano and kind of the principles or the technical fundamentals this project is built on top of. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, and thank you, Rick. That was a great introduction. And I'd also like to add on to Rick's point about the target or the target demographic for who we're trying to speak to. So I saw some comments on Reddit regarding, you know, some people are upset when we're not technical enough and some people are upset when we're too technical. So different episodes are going to elicit different reactions from the audience. And Sometimes it's just going to be us three, and sometimes we're going to have some of the IOHK All-Stars. But I can't guarantee that the All-Stars are going to be on every single episode. And the most important thing, if we're serious about the longevity of Cardano as an ecosystem, we need to make sure that the information is presented in a very understandable format. Uh, people need to understand, they need to have a rudimentary understanding of what Cardano is. It's not necessarily, you don't have to be a software engineer to feel completely involved with this project it's going to we want to try to get millions of users within cardano and not everyone needs to have a engineering perspective of what cardano is but the important rudimentary understanding of what the project is is what we're trying to go after so that being said i'm going to pass it back on to rick and maybe we can start our questions all right thank you philippe i appreciate it and as a, also one more reminder this is not financial advice. Uh, our program is for information. If you need financial advice, go find a professional uh, advice from somewhere else. Uh, this is only information on how cryptocurrencies work. Okay, so I'm going to start at the website called cardanodocs.com slash introduction. You select introduction. And the introductory paragraph, I'm just going to read through that real quick. And I'm going to roll into our questions for discussion. And that web page starts off with, uh, Dear Reader, the purpose of this documentation is to provide you with an understanding of the first layer of the Cardano platform stack, the settlement layer. If you have an understanding of what the settlement layer is, we suggest you first read the differences between the paper and the implementation, and there's a link there. 
and then move on to the documentation and protocols. But we're going to assume that you don't know what the settlement layer is, and that's what we're going to discuss. Uh, this documentation targets IOHK developers, third-party software developers, auditors, and consultants who collaborate on implementing Cardano settlement layer or use a Cardano and settle layer reference implementation. Then it goes on to describe what is Cardano settlement layer, cryptocurrency basics, uh, why do we care, and if how it affects speed, and whether or not it's your own money, pseudonymity. Those are a few of the factors that are the, uh, the pros of cryptocurrency. So what I'd like to do to start this off here is our first question is, what are the pros and cons of fiat versus crypto and the practicality in the real world use cases? And I would like to start from when I was younger, from when I was a kid up into my late teens and early 20s. <clears throat> I'm about 50 years old. And uh, when I was younger, when people conducted transactions with fiat money, uh, we had cash, and cash was easy, it was simple, it's easily recognized. But most people used checkbooks, okay? And a checkbook is a really good example to compare and contrast to cryptocurrency because in your checkbook, in the front, you had a ledger where you, rec you kept your balance and you wrote down and you recorded the transactions that you were doing. Then behind the ledger, there was a stack of checks and they were serialized and so on. So let's say you're at the grocery store. So I'm at the grocery store and I'm going to make a purchase. There's a long line at the register. Well, why is this line so long? Well, because people are paying with check and or cash and they, they had to get change made. But let's uh, take the example of they're paying with check. So they go to purchase their groceries and they take the time to fill out their check and write this out. And it's a way of transferring their uh, fiat from their bank to the store where they're writing this check. And when they fill it out, they hand it to the cashier. They assume that the check is good, uh, unless they have a list of uh, people who are banned from writing checks at that location. They accept the check, and you get your groceries and so on. Then the person takes the time to write down in their ledger how much did they spend and what it was for, and they kept track of it all. And that's how the transaction was done. And it would take, I don't know, three, four minutes per person to uh, conduct a transaction. So the fiat method at the time, you know, prior to the real onset of the internet was slow. And some of the repercussions were, let's say your check bounced. Let's say you didn't keep your ledger correctly. Well, what would happen is that check would get returned and you would get a return check fee of like $25 or $35, which is pretty expensive. And the reason for these return check fees was one, it was a punishment in a sense, but really what it was for is because of all the time and effort for that check to be processed by the store and by the bank and then to find out it was no good and send it back and then collect the money that was owed, uh, you, you wasted a lot of people's time in the process. And so they had to say, all right, we got to recoup this time and effort we put into that. So, you know, that method worked well for many, many decades. Uh, the check writing process worked, but it was long, labor intensive, uh, wasn't cost effective. Uh, so you kind of uh, cash, always pretty quick, um, still takes some time to get that uh, transaction taken care of. Then you fast forward into the future, we have credit cards where the ledger now starts to become more automated. Uh, the credit cards have become now become what they're called check cards and debit cards, where it keeps the ledger for you and you can check it on your phone. So that's moving a lot quicker. But there's this illusion of speed uh, with modern check cards and uh, cell phones, okay? The illusion of speed is you conduct this transaction and right up front it looks like, oh, I instantly got my product and they instantly got paid and so on, but that's not really the case. Uh, there, there's some time involved for these transactions to propagate and the, the store where you purchase your stuff, it does kind of like a check with the bank and says, okay, yeah, that, that their, their credit's good or they immediately get rejected, but the actual transaction in the background takes a lot longer than uh, the few seconds it took for you to swipe your card and walk off with your goods. So that's just kind of like a, an example of the use of fiat um, in the context of making a transaction at a store. So then we go into the pros and cons of fiat versus crypto. And the pros of fiat, I mean, really what we have here 
is that's low hanging fruit. That's real easy. It's ubiquitous. But I keep saying this word Fiat, and to a lot of people, what's a Fiat? Well, it's a it's an Italian made car, right? I mean, that's how a lot of people look at it. But uh, at this point, we need to touch on what is Fiat. Who wants to take that question? What is Fiat, and what are the pros? So Fiat, I mean, this is a great question. Fiat, I would best describe it as your local currency. So if you're in the United States, it's going to be the U.S. dollar. If you're in Japan, like Sebastian, it's going to be the yen. Wherever you are, there's a local currency, and that's considered fiat. So fiat is just that dollar value, whatever dollar you use in your particular country. And I would like to touch back on Rick's first point about this illusion of speed in the current monetary system with fiat you know, with credit cards and checks, you're under the assumption that these things cash immediately. But at the at the end of the day, at the end of every banking day, banks actually close their accounts, they sweep their accounts, and they're communicating with all the credit card companies and checking companies and they're balancing their ledger. And this happens on an everyday basis. So things take a lot longer to settle than 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 what you do. So Things could take three to five days to settle, but based on uh, trust of certain transactions for a certain individual, things are going to speed up based on that. But ledgers have to be balanced on a either daily or weekly basis. Um, that being said, I would like to probably my answer of what's the what are the pros and cons between crypto and fiat. I'd like to more take it as a comparison of what I think crypto is in comparison to fiat. And I think that crypto's use case or crypto's utility in comparison to fiat really hasn't been determined yet um, because the fiat, the current fiat system of Western nations is so smooth at the moment. Um, I'm not talking about countries that are experiencing hyperinflation, but if you live in a Western country, if you live in the States, you know, you're experiencing certain levels of inflation, of course, but at the end of the day, it's a lot easier to use cash or credit or you know use your checkbook than it is to use crypto at the moment. And the, the purpose of crypto was to move away from the current monetary system and have a more immutable ledger and a way to increase the speed of transactions. I would argue that crypto hasn't necessarily done that yet. Um, I hear when I first got into crypto, it was this idea of escaping inflation. And, you know, last time I checked, if you check Bitcoin, they have, I think, up to 100 forks as of the beginning of Bitcoin's um, in, as of Bitcoin's inception. So when I first got into crypto, I was thinking, what's the difference between forks and actual inflation in the monetary system? Um, you know, printing money out of thin air. But Bitcoin has tons of forks. They have Bitcoin Cash. They have Bitcoin SV at Bitcoin Cash ABC, they have Bitcoin God, Bitcoin Private. So it seems like forks are just printed constantly. And I don't know if someone wants to correct me on whether or not that constitutes inflation, but I think that it constitutes inflation. Another reason why crypto was invented was to take out this middleman. And this middleman in the current fiat system is your traditional bank or your traditional credit card or your traditional checking company. Whatever companies that you're using, you have to go through a middleman. And the issue with that is, you know, you go to your bank, whatever bank you have, they close. You know, you have to wait in line to get your money, but they have certain business hours. You can't go after that. Or if you want to go to an ATM and take out money, you have restrictions on that. You know, you can, depending on the bank, oh, you know, they tell you, oh, you can only take out $500 in a day. And what happens if you want to take $600? And it really takes away the power of the individual to access your money. And crypto is supposed to solve that. I don't think it's solving that now because at the end of the day, most people are still using middlemen in crypto. They still keep their crypto on exchanges, so they're still subject to... You know, whatever Binance and Bittrex, if they shut down, they have to wait to hold, get their money. So I don't think people have made that tradition yet, uh, transition yet. And I think that Cardano is looking to invent or looking to revolutionize crypto and give it an actual use case and give it actual advantages over the current monetary system or over current fiat. And I'm looking forward to this. And I think 
that's probably my short answer of what the pros and cons of crypto and fiat are more of a comparison but that's the way i rationalized it i think there's kind of two parts to the advantage the first one is trying to build a currency based on mathematics and what i mean by building a currency based on mathematics is that there's a, a, a set of rules that you can prove whether or not they're a fault right you can prove that you don't have money or you can prove that you have a certain amount of money or you can prove that you sent money to somebody else right and that's extremely hard with the current fiat systems right imagine you gave five dollars to bob and you want to prove to somebody you really sent five dollars to somebody right that's extremely difficult if it's uh you know in cash it's just not even possible the best thing you could have done is maybe take a pic took a picture of like the bill like the maybe you took a picture of the five dollar bill and then Bob takes a picture of the five dollar bill and you go like hey like the pictures match or like some weird thing the serial numbers match right it's not super trustworthy and it's not super easy to do right so if you don't have a bank account aka you don't have a trusted middleman you cannot even prove whether or not you sent money to somebody or not and you cannot prove the ownership of a certain amount of money really so that's kind of a complication right and okay so let's say you, you do have a bank account then you, you can send you know five dollars somebody through your bank account and then you can maybe prove with like some bank statements that you really did send money but then you have to like go to the bank get the bank statements you have to get them to sign it or whatever to prove to people that you didn't just like uh, print this out and just like uh, fake the data Right, so it's not an easy process to prove that even like the bank statements or whatever are, are are actually accurate. And so we've built up an entire system that seems kind of crazy in a sense, where we just kind of half trust people, right? So if somebody gives you a hundred dollars and says like, go buy something for an event, you go to the grocery store, you buy some stuff, and then you get a receipt, right? And you give them back the receipt, and you like, see, I spent your hundred dollars to buy these things, right? But it's just like a piece of paper, right? There's no actual proof. You could have gone home, printed this on a piece of paper, and then just give it to them. And in fact, a lot of companies will accept without a receipt, just like something written on paper, right? You have like a paper list and you wrote down what you bought and how much it costs, and you're like, here's my receipt. And so this is not like a super trustable system, but it's what we have. And so people have just built societies on top of this and whatever. The advantage a crypto gets is that you can now have a ledger and you can generate a mathematical proof on the ledger that a transaction happened or a certain account owns a certain balance or a certain account does not own a certain balance right and this is if you live in a transparent cryptocurrency for example bitcoin or whatever where we don't use any privacy features uh, but the ability to prove stuff about uh, financial transactions is extremely powerful uh, so you can think of, in a way, as the, the transition to this more mathematical-based system is, is getting rid of the middleman, right? Just like I say, if you just have cash, you cannot prove that you sent somebody uh, sent money to somebody, right? You can get some amount of trust by going through a middleman, right? Because then the bank can, you know, claim something happened, and then if you trust the bank, then you're okay with it, right? Uh, but now you're replacing this middleman with just, you know, some system in the sky. The problem is somebody has to be the person that actually processes these transactions in the sky, right? There's there's somebody at the end of the day that's pro processing your Bitcoin transaction or whatever, right? And so and that's where we get into the decentralized nature of it, which is kind of the other advantage, which is nobody can really block your transaction, right? If you make a transaction on the Bitcoin network, there's a very high chance it gets through and nobody can block it. And so that has some good use cases. For example, if you're doing a kind of business that is completely legal, but you know, somebody disagrees with it, doesn't want, doesn't want to take the PR risk of being the middleman for you, uh, then the cryptocurrency kind of allows you to get past it. Uh, but just in general, you know, people have had problems with banking systems. Right, you cannot possibly claim, oh yeah, the banking system works for everybody. There's, you know, a certain subset of the population where just, you know, if for some reasons things are not working, 
sometimes the banks, you know, fail or do something questionable has what happened in the last crisis, right? So with all that that happened, we cannot possibly claim that this system has worked for 100% of the people. And so when that happens, you need an alternative system, right? And you say, okay, maybe the banking system failed for you for whatever. There's some edge case that you hit into and it didn't work. Now we have an alternative system with a different kind of middleman, which happens to be, you know, the crypto in the sky that's creating the blocks. And this middleman can allow you to prove that transaction happened or these other properties you would like to have. And I think that's an advantage. So that's kind of my 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 pitch to why I think uh, crypto cryptocurrencies have, you know, a reason to exist. All right, Sebastian. So what I want to do, since we're since we're beating up on the middleman and going back to the ledger, I want to continue with that. Um, another example: of the middleman uh, and why, what the pros and cons of fiat. There's not. There are not a whole lot of cons to fiat. Fiat has a lot going for it. Um, but one of the biggest cons that I've seen is when you go to withdraw your money. If you go to an ATM, if I want to take out $20 or $40 or $100, uh, like Philippe mentioned, it's limited. You know, there might be some type of limit to how much you can take out. But at the same time, they're charging you a withdrawal fee of two dollars two dollars and fifty cents sometimes three dollars depending on where you're at you know if you're at an airport they'll they'll get you real high that's a first world problem okay that's not the problems that they're experiencing in other countries that don't have a banking system but you know they're skimming that money off of you <clears throat> now that's a little bit different than when you go to an exchange uh let's say coinbase or bittrex and you go to exchange your money and you're changing dollars to crypto they're charging you a fee for the risk that they accept. Uh, what they're doing with the ATMs, when you go to withdraw your crypto from the ATMs, they're charging you a fee for providing a service, okay? So, and those little fees add up and we don't think about them. If you check your bank statement once in a while and you look at all those fees, they add up. So uh, dealing with the uh, fiat does have a lot of expenses to it. Uh, it. It adds up over time. It just kind of leeches your money off. And to follow up with also what Sebastian was saying on the ledger, uh, the ledger is one of the most fascinating things that I learned in crypto. Like I, I, I was involved with crypto for well over a year until I really understood what the block explorer was. And every crypto out there has a block explorer. So if you're new to crypto and you're watching this podcast, go check out the block explorers for all the different types of crypto and the ones that you're using because uh, there you can see the ledger, all the transactions and whatever the transaction uh, ID is and the address for your wallet and all those neat things. So that's pretty cool. That's an advantage of uh, cryptocurrencies. So uh, Rick, anything else on that? I've got a quick and dirty list here of pros and cons. Yes, yes. I just wanted to pose a question to both of you, jumping off what Sebastian said. Um, this whole idea of maybe... Like if you're operating in uh, the traditional monetary system, you're using fiat, there's no real way to track a transaction. I mean, if you're passing $5, if I give Sebastian $5 or vice versa, there's no reporting that. It's just based on whatever he or I say. And I could say I gave him $10. He could say I gave him $20. He could say he gave me $20. No one could verify with 100% accuracy. And I think that's what crypto can do more often. But my question comes what which system is easier to game like i know if you're doing illicit activities in the current monetary system it's easy to kind of slip under the radar especially when you're filing taxes for example i don't know maybe if you work a traditional job your things get reported directly to the government you get your pay stub removed but if you're a small business you can really get up get away with murder you can do whatever you want. You just have to tell the government, oh, I made this or I lost this and, you know, I made X amount of dollars, but I lost X plus three dollars at the end of the year. And you can literally just kind of skim your way through the system. Can do you see drawbacks, the same kind of drawbacks within crypto as you do with fiat? And what kind of gaming will people do within that system? I don't see a whole lot of drawbacks in crypto with people gaming the system. It is rather difficult to game it because of the design and the nature of crypto. Um, 
but crypto does have a negative stigma attached to it still today so for those of you that are new to crypto just keep that in mind if you're dealing with crypto what do a lot of other people that are non-crypto users they think you're doing something illegal so and i just say that with a, a humorous context because what i'll have is people will often send me either an article or um a piece of information or a friend of mine will talk about they say yeah I heard of Bitcoin people are using that to fund terrorism or people are using that to launder money and uh, that's one of the drawbacks is the negative stigma attached to it and we need to get past that stigma because Bitcoin didn't invent crime crime has been around for millenniums and centuries ever since the beginning of money uh, there's there's been money crimes and Bitcoin is no different, so uh, it does ha it does get that stigma because of the anonymity, which is a good thing. It, anonymity and privacy are good; people like that. And at the same time, other people say, "Well, I don't like that because uh, you you can hide your your deals, you can hide your transactions." Uh, but in in the long run, that's what Cardano is designed for to handle. You can do tra transactions with privacy. Recently, there was a paper that came out called uh, Ouroboros Cryptosynis. I can't pronounce it correctly. Um, that is uh, a guarantee of privacy during proof of stake. Okay, and so that's a pro that crypto has. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, Philippe. Um, yeah, if I, I can try answering it. I mean. I don't think it really solves that problem. At the end of the day, you have to kind of try to keep building. The reason I say that is because, you know, in a crypto system, you cannot fake that money appeared or disappeared. You cannot fake a transaction. However, you can create new accounts at will, right? So you can create a new account, a new address or rather, and then send, you know, X plus three to that address and say, oh, my business had a cost then we had to send this much money and this address is owned by somebody, trust me about it. Right, yeah. so if you want to go about trying to game the system, there's no way to do it in any system. Oh yeah, I know what you mean. Like if I wanted to hide money from paying taxes on it, I can just move it to a different address that I just created and say, that's not my money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, that's a good idea as a matter of fact. <laughs> Wait, I didn't say that on the air. <laughs> no, but I mean, this the ex problem exists in the current system also, right? You get paid in cash, you put it under your mattress or whatever, you know, nobody knows. You know, people put money on like PayPal, they send money on PayPal, they receive money on PayPal. Do they claim that to the government? Probably a large percent of people just don't, right? They're purchasing whatever and receiving money on PayPal from their friends and like, ah, oh, whatever, I just won't report it as income on my taxes. And this is extremely common, right? Yeah, and most of the industries that pay no in cash. What? Yeah, most of the industries that uh, where, where you're getting paid in cash, you know, it's not on the books most of the time. Yeah, but I mean, exactly. even like uh, PayPal, right? People put up like a donation links or like a, you know, send me $20 on PayPal and I'll send you a custom picture or whatever. It, and, you know, probably some people report this on their taxes. But I'm willing to bet a large amount of people just don't, right? They don't consider this as like some sort of real income. They don't consider this as a job. And so they feel like, yeah, whatever, this is like something on the side, and I don't have to report this as income or whatever, even though theoretically, probably you should, right? And so this kind of thing where people just don't report stuff, it, you know, crypto is not going to change that. And I remember even for like uh, tradable items in video games, it's also a problem, right? Some people sell like uh, skins or items inside video games. And, you know, some systems provide a marketplace for this, right? So Steam has like a marketplace where if you want to sell an item on Steam, you can sell it to other people. And uh, theoretically, this is income, right? Right? You put in some work to get some item and you sold to somebody for some amount of money, right? And if you made a certain amount of money off of this, then you should be reporting this on your taxes, right? But probably a lot of people just don't, right? They don't consider this as the real job, so they, don't, they feel like it's morally okay just not report it or whatever. And so I don't think crypto... Uh, yeah, I some people think uh, they, people think it's uh, it's not trackable or traceable, but it is. You know, if that crypto ever touched an exchange, it's trackable. Unless it came from a miner uh, and it had never touched an exchange, it can definitely be tracked. 
It looks like the video likes switching over to Sebastian. We're just going to roll with it. Even if it switches over to Sebastian, you know, I'd rather have the camera looking at you anyway. You're a lot better looking than I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me go over my quick and dirty list. You guys ready for that? Yeah. Yes. Quick and dirty, the way I like it. Pros and cons. All right, pros of fiat. It's widely accepted. It's easily understood. People recognize it. Some of the cons of fiat, it's... Uh, steadily decreasing value. As more fiat is printed, the value of the fiat in your pocket goes down. Uh, fiat always depends on the middleman. It depends on the government to create it. And it must be exchanged for local currencies when you are crossing borders. For example, when I go from the U.S. to Japan, I need to convert my dollars to yen uh, to the local currency. Whereas if you were using cryptocurrency, that wouldn't be necessary. However, with crypto, it brings other problems. Now, the other list, the crypto side, the benefits of crypto, direct transaction, no middleman, very fast, high speed, smaller fees overall. When you're dealing with crypto to crypto transactions, they are actually very low fees. The purchase on an exchange might be a high fee, but that's a benefit of crypto. The cons of crypto, the cons, lack of real world use cases, the negative stigma, uh, lack of adoption, it's not widely used by merchants yet, and it is uh, December of 2018, so mark my words, at some point in the future, it will be more widely accepted. We just don't know when. Crypto, another con okay. is it's not well understood. Uh, crypto is just not well understood by the masses. And uh, lastly, on my quick and dirty list here, if you guys have anything else to add, let me know. But there are high exchange fees to acquire crypto or the high cost of a miner to create the crypto in the first place. So quick and dirty list I got. Anything else, guys, before we go into the next segment? Yeah, if I want, if I can add something, I just want to say crypto, I like to call it an alternative system, right? So there's still kind of a middleman in a sense, which is the people creating the blocks. Right, it's just a different kind of concept of of who is the middleman and how they get selected, right? And the other thing is, there's still a fee, right? And it's beyond just the transaction fee, right? You're also paying the people who are creating the blocks, right? So, whenever, for example, you make a Bitcoin transaction, obviously you you pay the transaction fee in BTC, right? But you're also indirectly paying the transaction. Because, you know, a huge amount of money gets sent to the people creating the blocks for Bitcoin, right? It's millions per day, if I remember correctly, right? It's a lot. And so this is like a huge amount of money being taken out of, out of the ecosystem to fund these people that are creating the blocks, right? And it's not a direct fee, because you're not paying it directly, but because more Bitcoin gets created out of thin air to pay these miners, the value of your Bitcoin is dropping, Right. And so this is a different kind of fee system from the existing uh, fiat system, but it's still a fee, right? And so that's why I like to see it as an alternative system, right? If for some reason one system is working better for you than the other, then you're free to make the switch, right? But, you know, it's the fundamental components of the system are still kind of the same in a sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And that's also a good point to make to segue into the next section of the program where we're going to talk about proof of proof of work versus proof of stake. And along with proof of work comes a lot of fees. Uh, that's the miners that Sebastian was just talking about where they're getting a, a piece of a cut for processing the transactions. Um, and, you know, there's, there's uh, hidden fees here and there with the exchange we mentioned earlier. So, uh, you guys, for the next section, we got proof of work versus proof of stake. And a lot of us have been involved with crypto for a while. We know what proof of work means. But for the new people coming to this program and picking up on this podcast, let's start with the historical sense. Who wants to uh, address that? What is proof of work? What is that? I can touch into that pretty quickly. Uh, if you want to, you want to do it, Sebastian? I mean, if you want to take a stab at it, go for it. Okay. Uh, so proof of work, if you're not familiar with Bitcoin or you just started hearing about Bitcoin, proof of work is like a gigantic math problem, a gigantic computation problem. And basically what it, what it entails is there's a ledger, so certain transactions are happening in a given time period. And every time that block gets completed or a given period of time gets completed, 
that block has to basically close or that ledger closes. So just like Rick was saying earlier, that checkbook, think about it. The checkbook is full. So it needs to it needs to close and update the entire system or the entire blockchain. But in order to update the entire blockchain, it's a race to find a the the solution to a very complex math problem. And that math problem is solved by specific miners or their GPUs or ASIC miners. And there's these specialized computers that basically have one task and one task only. It's to solve the equation or solve the answer to this particular block and unlock the secrets to that particular block and ultimately update the entire blockchain. So these ASIC miners, the the, the premise behind it is that the math problem gets more and more difficult over time. So certain ASIC mining machines that were purchased by some individual, I don't know, five years ago are not going to be are not going to be effective nowadays because the amount of computational power that you need increases over time, increases as the network grows. And for Bitcoin, it's just been steadily increasing. So. It's a giant math problem that is being solved by specialized computers to close the blocks and move from one block to the next block. I don't know if anyone wanted to add anything. Yeah, I think that's kind of a good high level explanation. I like to kind of go up another level in abstraction. Okay, so imagine you want to build a decentralized system. Okay, you need some group of people to create the blocks, right? To process the transactions, okay? You cannot have it be a static group because then it's possible one person gets corrupted or, you know, one person hates you and doesn't want to process your transactions, you know? You, there's, there's a huge list of problems you could go over if you have a static actor that's, that's processing the transactions, right? So you need a way to pick who gets to process the transaction in a way that it's non-deterministic right it's not always the same person and that person doesn't really know what's going to happen in a sense okay so to do that you need some sort of lottery system okay nobody knows who's going to win the lottery in the future people can participate in the lottery and we'll see what happens okay so what is proof of work so proof of work is a lottery system where the original vision was one cpu equals one ticket right and then the more tickets you have, the higher chance you have of winning the lottery. Okay. The proof of stake is a different system where one coin equals one ticket. The more coins you have, the more tickets you have, and therefore the higher chance you have of winning the lottery. And winning the lottery means you get to create the block, and by creating the block you get paid in some sort of cryptocurrency, right? In, in Bitcoin you get paid in Bitcoin, in Cardano you get paid in ADA, right? And so basically this entire concept, this entire field of research, is in a sense just trying to build a decentralized lottery, right? And this lottery is for creating the blocks. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, that makes sense. And what I'm gonna do to dumb that down, I'm gonna tie that back to my checkbook example that I gave at the beginning of the program with creating blocks. So, like I was saying, we're targeting this episode for the newcomers, and we're talking about things called blocks that are created by these computers that do proof of work. These blocks are they're a ledger. It just keeps track of how much money was spent, who sent it to who, who sent to who, who sent to who. And Sebastian mentioned it's done distributed. Proof of work computers are, are doing distributed uh, effort on these blocks. So if you remember the checkbook example I gave at the beginning, you open up your checkbook at the front, you have a ledger and down inside you have checks and each page in that checkbook is a, a block. Like that page would be a block, but it's not just your block or your checkbook it's a checkbook of everybody else who's involved with using that currency and the block explorer is what allows you to explore those blocks and the proof of work machines are the machines that are creating the money that goes into those blocks or, or whatever the case may be but the uh, but at any rate the, the blocks are a ledger and that's what the proof of work machines are signing off they're doing this complex math puzzle to say this is a valid block this is complete this is the ledger as it stands and it says block complete and then that proof of work machine gets a reward saying it's a way for the network to say thank you for finding that block and solving the math puzzle signed off check 
So what is the biggest disadvantage of proof of work? I think everybody here knows what it is. Who wants to take a shot at it? I think there are a couple disadvantages with proof of work. Um, one of them being their energy consumption. So as uh, I studied environmental biology in college and when I was first introduced to Bitcoin, I, I, I read several articles about how much energy it actually takes to process these transactions. So if you're not familiar with um, proof of work mining, basically you can involve yourself today. All you have to do is go on a site called bitmain.com and purchase an ASIC miner, A-S-I-C miner. And that's that specialized computer that's going to solve that proof of, proof of work equation. And it, you can look them up on YouTube. They're very noisy. And over time, they have to increase their computational power. Like I was saying before, a machine, an ASIC miner machine, five years ago is not going to do anything today because the computers that are solving them are much quicker, much faster, much more powerful. So you need to have the latest and greatest machine to even give yourself a shot of solving that, that, that computational problem. So basically what this has done is increase the amount of electricity or power that Bitcoin needs because Bitcoin is a proof of work system to actually function. And it's gotten incredible over over the years and you're going to hear many arguments on many different sides but before you hear an argument advocating for the electricity use of bitcoin you also have to question the person that is telling you that argument for the electricity use of bitcoin meaning that if the person's pockets are extremely deep and they hold a lot of bitcoin as as it is they're just like oh you know electricity use oh it's fine oh you know whatever whatever rationale they have behind it they're rich they're going to become richer they're less worried about the environmental effects of this cryptocurrency but at the end of the day these environmental effects are real i printed out a couple of statistics just so i can get my facts straight and right now the bitcoin's current estimated annual electricity consumption is 52.88 terawatt hours per year and Bitcoin's current minimum annual electricity consumption is 45.41 terawatt hours per year. And if you're not familiar with how much energy that is, that is an incredible amount of energy. And it doesn't go down. It goes up year by year by year by year. When Bitcoin was very small, it used a relatively lower amount of electricity to process these transactions. But over time, it has increased dramatically. The country closest to Bitcoin in terms of electricity consumption as of today is the country of Bangladesh. So the entire of a country of Bangladesh uses the same amount of electricity that Bitcoin uses to process their proof of work transactions. Now, you're going to hear some counter arguments within the community saying that, oh, well, you know, they're, we're going to be using Bitcoin's going to be using a more renewable resource. They're going to be using renewable energy resources in order to mine. So basically, the ASIC miners are going to be running on clean energy, whether that be wind or solar, whatever clean energy is available in that area. But the, the, the fact is that's furthest from the truth. The largest Bitcoin miners are in China and they're using coal in order to process these transactions and to think that a decentralized cryptocurrency is not going to be utilizing the dirty forms of energy is just it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense although there may be more renewable resource uh, renewable energy resources coming in the future these still require energy to make these renewable resources so you need energy to create solar farms you need energy to create um, wind turbines you need energy to create the system so proof of work is a lot it's very energy intensive a waste of energy in my opinion um, i have one more statistic the number of u.s households powered for one day for the electricity consumed for a single transaction so a single transaction so if i sent sebastian today 0 0.001 bitcoin the value, the amount of energy it would take to process that transaction, relatively speaking, is the amount of energy it um, U.S. households produce in one day from 18 households. So 18 households combine their electricity output for one day, and that's that dumb transaction I sent 0 .001 BTC from myself to Sebastian. That's a waste. So people are going to buy some stupid socks online 
and they're using the amount of energy for 18 houses and i know you may not care about electricity usage you may live in a first world country you may live in some skyscraper in new york or um you know you may live in san francisco and you don't care about the rest of the world and you leave your lights on all day and you leave your computer running all day but that's a real transaction it affects the world and i'm sorry any transaction that takes the electricity usage of 18 u.s households and this is the minimum it's going to increase it's dumb people are doing dumb transactions all day and I just don't think it's useful. So that's one of my gripes for um, proof of work. Sorry that I got so heated. Um, I just think that I, I'm passionate about the electricity usage of proof of work versus proof of stake. And once again, to remind everyone, Cardano is much more sustainable. It's a proof of stake system, not a proof of work. Bitcoin is a proof of work. All right, Sebastian, I, I, you can jump in. Yeah, I mean, this is what I was talking about earlier where I was saying it's an alternative system, right? The proof of work for Bitcoin is beyond just a huge amount of electricity use. It's a huge cost to the network, right? So I was just saying, I think the cost to the network is something around like a million per day. It's in the millions per day. So if you look at the price of Bitcoin, that's like, you know, slowly going down over time. This is the fee you're paying for all these people wasting this electricity to get the Bitcoin, right? So they run these miners and huge farms. And then they got to pay the bills. So they sell, sell part of the Bitcoins to pay the bills, right? And the entire network is covering that cost. So if you have a, a more sustainable system, not only do you save electricity, but you save electricity for all the participants of the system, right? So that's one thing I want to, you know, just mention real quick. Uh, but one thing I want to say also is, so what's fundamental, fundamentally the difference uh, between, sorry, uh, proof of work and proof of stake, right? So I was talking about the lottery system earlier, uh, but you have to kind of have a discussion about how we get these tickets, right? The tickets for the lottery. And how is getting these tickets differ between the two systems, right? So as I was saying earlier, the proof of work is supposed to be like a one CPU equals one ticket, whereas in proof of stake, it's one coin equals one ticket. But so what's the difference between a coin and a CPU in a sense? Okay, well the thing is that the CPU is a resource you have to burn that lives off the chain. Okay, in proof of stake, the coin is a resource that lives within the system and you don't have to burn it, right? And that difference is what causes all the technological differences between proof of work and proof of stake. Right, because for example, if a proof of stake system gets a rollback, the history like reverts, you do not like uh, lose the system, use the coins. You still have your lottery tickets, right? In the proof of work system, if the history rolls back, you lost that energy, the time to mine forever, right? And this is because it's a resource you have to consume and the consumption happens off chain, right? So you can imagine a system that's kind of a hybrid between the two. And what, I, what I mean is that, okay, let's have a proof of stake coin where when you stake your coins, you're actually burning your coins. Okay, so now we're kind of in between proof of work and proof of stake. Okay, you have to burn a resource to get your ticket but the resource still lives on chain. Well, then what happens is this rollback, right? Then you get your resource back out of nowhere, right? So the fact that your resource lives on the chain actually does make a, dif make a difference, right? So I think I just want to like cover this difference between the two systems fundamentally, because if you're wondering why proof of stake is such a hard mathematical problem, and why it's taking us so long to do all the research to get where we are now, it's because proof of work is kind of a simpler system in that sense. You know, you burn some resource that splits off a chain, and then somehow you get takes out of this to participate in the library, right? Uh, but proof of stake, because it lives inside the system and you don't lose it, the security argument has to be much more detailed 
I'm not sure how to say detailed, but like uh, much more involved. And I would uh, so hopefully I would that like was a good explanation. To, yes, and I would like to add that that security debate is is very prevalent within the crypto community. Uh, people that are very uh, high proponents of proof of work systems like proof of work protocols like Bitcoin are going to argue that proof of stake protocols are less secure. Um, but at the end of the day, proof of work do have their own security flaws themselves. They're subject to 51 percent attacks. And Bitcoin is basically what that means is the amount of computing power. So let's say all the hashing power, all the ASIC mining power, those specialized computing machines. If one party owns 51 percent of that hashing power or that computing power, they can do things to manipulate the blockchain in their favor. Whether that's whatever they can do, they can create coins out of thin air, roll back systems. They're in control of the network. And that's a real vulnerability of Bitcoin. And I just want to preface this by saying that I am a fan of Bitcoin, but it has its problems. There are better out there. And the only reason why I say this is because I, I mentioned that site bitmain.com to order your ASIC miner, but that is a Chinese company. And the reason why I'm saying this is because there are pools and you know, basically, if you join these pools, you increase your chances of winning or solving that computational problem because all the computing power gets combined and you just increase your chances. So there are these big pools that amalgamate all their ASIC mining machines and a large percentage of them are in China. And I believe it's upwards to almost 50 percent now. So, you know, and I'm not saying anything bad against China, but the Chinese government, if they wanted to, I don't know, take over the Bitcoin network, they could do it. Theoretically, they could do it. I mean, China has certain, um, the government could come and take over these farms overnight if they wanted to and take control of the Bitcoin network. I don't know how everyone else feels, but I think that's a real concern within the traditional proof of work for Bitcoin. Yeah, there have been takeovers before, so it's fair enough to have concern about that. Uh, Philippe, what I want to do is I want to touch on some of the, the statistics that you mentioned earlier, like the 56 terawatts or, of uh, power per year that's been used. And uh, what I had done is looked up approximations that's about $300,000 per hour. That's what I was doing while you guys were talking. I was listening. Um but there's information out there saying it's about $300,000 per hour to run the miners. And I did some quick math at 12.5 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, which is the current proof of work for Bitcoin. 12.5 times 6 to give you one hour times $4,000 per Bitcoin is $300,000. So when Bitcoin drops to... 4,000. Uh, last week it dipped below 4,000. When it hits 4,000, there's no, there's really no ROI. I mean, the miners are going to get ROI, but it's going to average out. So that's just a quick math I ran here. Uh, Bitcoin's at $4,200 right now. So you're actually going to make a little bit of money, just a little bit by mining Bitcoin based off of the power and using the ASICs. Uh, so I just kind of want to roll that back into what are the pros and cons of proof of work versus proof of stake. And for the, for the average person out there, proof of work has proven secure. Now that that's been proven secure, uh, the migration is towards proof of stake. And what Cardano is trying to do is get proof of stake to have the same properties as proof of work, the same security properties so that proof of stake is just as secure. With proof of stake, your coins, like Sebastian had mentioned, your tokens become the miner because they reside in the network and they provide the security to the network. It's very complex. It's a little bit uh, higher level. That's for a future episode. We'll get into more details on that on a future episode. But for now, the compare and contrast is proof of work is you use a physical computer to secure the network. It burns a lot of energy. Proof of stake, you're using your value as the miner uh, to secure the network. And some of the advantages to proof of work, are not just security, but in a proof of work system, if the token you're mining loses value, you can just repoint your miner to another token that makes more money. 
fair enough. Uh, there are some advantages to proof of work. And you can just pick another coin and say, I don't like this one anymore, I want that one instead. And with proof of stake, one of the drawbacks is, is if you if you don't want to invest in that token anymore, your token serves as the miner, and you want to change up. Basically, when you trade your token, you're selling your miner off. But of course, you're buying into a new one or you're buying into a different coin, so it's not a total loss. Uh, it's more of a loss on the miner because they just over time they're not powerful enough. So that was a just a compare and contrast on proof of work, proof of stake, pros and cons between and the two. Uh, I wanted to add to that a quick visualization for those who are very new to this system and they want to get involved they want to they hear oh i can get rewarded for mining bitcoin let me invest in an asic miner but like i said before those asic miners are very noisy you're gonna to have to put them in your house or some kind of um office building and they're going to make noise 24 7 very loud very obnoxious so you need to basically build a soundproof barrier connect to whatever pool that you're trying to connect to and move forward there. And if you're not completely technically savvy, this may be a little bit difficult for you. But on the other hand, you have a proof of stake protocol like Cardano. There's no noisy computing equipment. You don't have to keep your computer on for 24 hours a day. All you're gonna have to do to participate within this protocol is download the Daedalus wallet. And you know, you're gonna, Yodoi, the light wallet will also move um, stake in the future. But Download the Daedalus wallet on DaedalusWallet.io and get ready for staking in, in 2019. And it's going to be easy as you're delegating your coins to a pool and then you go to sleep. That's it. It's not leaving your computer on. You don't need any fancy extra computing power to add on to your system. You just need a computer or in the future, you may just need a phone and you will be rewarded for participating within the system. That just wanted to make that clear. Thanks, Philippe. That was a great summary on or at least the wrap up there on uh, the benefits of proof of work, proof of stake, proof of stake. You're going to get a return on investment. And uh, they've gone through game theory to figure that out. Sebastian, anything else? You're ready for the next segment. The security aspect uh, real quick. Sorry, can yep. you hear me earlier or? Yeah, you just I I cut out maybe you popped out. Yeah. So, yeah, just security. Sorry, yeah, aspect. So I just wanted to talk about the security argument real quick. So. People like to think of the 51% attack on a proof of work network as some sort of abstract attack that never really happens in practice. It's just some theoretical thing. But the reality is these attacks happen and they've happened very often, right? Especially if you think back to like uh, 2013, 2014, uh, back then proof of uh, work, 51% attacks were extremely common. It just happened all the time. Just coins were just destroyed day after day uh, by these attacks. You know, large systems such as Bitcoin, which has a lot of participants, were fairly safe against the attacks. Uh, but during that time, you know, cryptocurrencies were kind of going up in price, going up in hype and whatever. And people want to try and create new coins to innovate in the space, to fix certain parts of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, right? And they would launch cryptocurrency and it's a proof of work currency. And when you launch a coin, it starts out with zero, like a zero proof of work, right? There's nobody mining it. And during these early days, you are so vulnerable, right? And if just a single person comes in, they can just destroy your network. And people do this all the time, right? Because you can make money off of it. And so at the time, the entire, I wouldn't say research, but the focus was how do we make new coins and launch new coins in a way that is safe. And people came up with all these crazy algorithms for how the difficulty and whatever would all evolve over time to avoid these kind of vulnerable stages and whatever. But this is a real problem. And you can think of it more abstractly is how do we know proof of work is safe? If you look back at the Bitcoin white paper, there's no formal proof that proof of work is safe, right? There's no security argument or whatever other than the kind of a Hannah Wavy argument, right? It's only until much later that we figured out, well, actually, the Bitcoin network and any proof of work network is actually fairly vulnerable starting from 33%. Once you hit 33% and they're on, the quality of the network just drops and very fast. 
So if you get a, a minor with 30%, 33%, they can already start gaming the system pretty heavily. If you get like 40%, 45%, if the miner wants to, they can heavily deteriorate the system to the point where it's basically unusable. And then we finally had later on research by OHK that proved that proof of stake, or sorry, sorry, proof of work is actually safe, right? Uh, in the sense that they laid out a certain set of properties, and they said proof of work does match these properties. And it's the first time somebody really went out and did a formal argument of the safety of proof of work. And then later on, I just came, went on to obviously create Ouroboros, which was the proof of stake protocol. And Ouroboros Genesis, they proved that to add a certain level of, sorry, a certain level of abstraction, proof of work is as safe as proof of stake. Okay, so they've managed to prove that at a certain level of abstraction, they're both as safe. The question that kind of remains is, is this level of abstraction meaningful, right? Even if you can prove that at a certain abstraction is as safe, we need to see in real world, is it really as safe? And that still is kind of a remaining problem. There's some details that need to be worked out and whatever, and that's what Ajka is working on day in, day out. Uh, but there's some reason to believe it's going to work out. The basic idea is that um, IOHK has shown that proof of stake can have the same security properties as proof of work. Uh, and there's a lot of research papers out there. Well, it's, it, I highly recommend you go to the website IOHK.io, then select their research section. There's documentations there. Uh, I've checked earlier today, they have 31 papers released. Some of those papers speak to exactly what Sebastian was explaining. So if you want to drill down into the bloody details, it's a great resource, iohk.io, under their research. Uh, you can find the papers there. And they even have the very latest papers out that just came out in the last couple of weeks. The ones on parallel chains and the paper on uh, privacy in the proof of stake environment. Okay, so we're ready to move on to the next section. And thank you for the technical detailed explanation, Sebastian. Um, everyone always appreciates the fine detail and the, the thorough knowledge that you provide to this program. Okay, so the next section we're going to touch on is, and again, we'll need Sebastian for a lot of this, uh, is what is the difference between Cardano SL, the settlement layer, and Cardano CL? the compute layer. There's two different layers there. One of these layers is very relevant to the user or to the average Joe, and the other layer is very relevant to the banking systems and the advancement of technologies. They're both very important. You have to have both of those layers, but currently the primary layer that's out there that's deployed in the field is Cardano SL, the settlement layer. So uh, do, do one of you guys want to talk about what is the settlement layer? What, what are we actually looking at when we're talking about the settlement layer? So I just want to kind of cover the philosophical argument first. first. Okay, so if you think about Ethereum, which is the most popular uh, cryptocurrency that really uses a computation layer, I'll let you kind of expand on that. So, so what is a computation layer? It's a, a cryptocurrency that basically supports smart contracts. That's like the simple explanation, right? And so Ethereum is the most popular computation layer. And Ethereum has no settlement layer. It's only a computation layer. There's no way to escape the smart contract functionality. No matter what you're doing, you're exposed to this functionality, right? And the kind of philosophical problem this brings up is imagine you want to use Ethereum to run some sort of computation, right? You want to play CryptoKitties, or you want to participate in DAI, or some uh, other decentralized system that's running on Ethereum, right? You need to purchase some Ethereum to kind of participate in this computation, uh, but fundamentally, the price of Ethereum doesn't really relate to you doing this computation. So, right, so you're doing computation, and you don't need to buy a thousand dollars of of ether to be able to participate in this computation, right? As long as you have exactly enough money to pay for this crypto kitty, then you're good to go, right? And so you can kind of wonder, 
what is the value of Ether? If I don't need to, you know, buy a thousand, ten thousand Ether to participate in this world computer, do I really have any reason to do so? Right? Why would I not just only buy the amount I need to participate in the computation when I need to participate in it? Right? And so this is kind of different from the philosophy of Bitcoin, for example, where they say we're a, a settlement layer. This is a place where people can, you know, put all their money in. This is their savings. They don't touch it. And, you know, every now and then when they want to transfer money to somebody, you know, if they want to transfer money, then you make a Bitcoin transaction. So if you want to kind of resolve the philosophical problem, you could say, okay, we're splitting into two layers. Okay. The settlement layer where people put all their money and this is where they have the transactions, the financial transactions. And if you want to play crypto crypto or whatever, you only need to transfer as much money as you need to play the game to this other chain and do it. Right? And the money on this other chain where you actually run these smart contracts doesn't have an inherent value. Right? The money is or sorry, the value is derived from the settlement layer, right? And that's kind of the resolution to this uh, philosophical problem of, you know, why would the money on the computation layer have any value if I only need to pay for the cost of running the computation I care about? Okay, Sebastian, thanks for that. You got the philosophical part that you covered here. You covered the technical part of the computation layer and the settlement layer. And what we're doing with this program for the beginners is we're trying to make sure you guys understand uh, what those different layers are and how they affect you, the user of the cryptocurrency. So what we're going to touch on next is the settlement layer. Now, it sounds complex. There's a lot of important software running in the background, but... It's actually quite simple. The settlement layer is how you exchange money. So I have four examples of wallets uh, pulled up. I've got some on the screen behind me. Can you guys see that okay? I want to make sure I got this. I know people don't like doing live demos, but I personally, I don't care. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to do live demos. But one thing I need to be personally and situationally aware of is that we are doing a podcast. Uh, it's also going to be available on audio. Some people are going to be audio only. So when I put stuff up on the screen, I'm going to describe it thoroughly verbally. So what I have up on my display here is I got Daedalus Wallet. You guys can see that okay? Yep. It's All right. It's small, but I can see it. It's kind of small. I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, I don't have it completely. Uh, anyway, uh, here I have... Ada Light running in a web browser. Okay. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open another tab. This is in the Chrome web browser. And I'm going to launch Euroe. I'm logged in here as Deadpool. So I'm going to launch the Deadpool wallet. Wade Wilson. Yep, Deadpool's wallet. There we go. Uh, and so there's three different types of wallets. I have Daedalus. I have uh, Ada Light which also connects to the hardware wallet uh, Trezor. However, Lato, Ada Lite runs entirely inside uh, the Chrome web browser. It also runs inside Firefox. And I have a fourth wallet right here on my cell phone called Infinito. All right there. I don't know if you can see that. There we go, Infinito wallet. Okay, and it runs Cardano Ada. So let's start with, uh, since we're talking about the settlement layer, we have about 15 minutes left on the program. Actually, we're down to about 10. How, how does Daedalus, I got to remember to turn towards the mic, sorry. <laughs> how is Daedalus related to the settlement layer? Who wants to take a shot yeah, at that one? I mean, so I, I just want to say, I have to be careful when talking about wallets because obviously I work for Mergle, which made Yodoi. And also, I did a lot of the coding for Yodoi also. So I'm super biased on this topic. Uh, so keep in mind uh, this bias whenever I talk about wallets. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah. so, so starting me... with the... Uh, sorry, Philippe, you want to go? But yeah, yes. I, can, I can say something. I can say All something. Right. So 
First of all, if you're not familiar, we're talking about the settlement layer, which is the accounting layer. And what Sebastian was basically saying before, the differences between the Cardano settlement layer, the CSL, and the CCL, the Cardano computational layer, is one is running smart contracts, one is running an accounting. And the reason why they're separated is because sometimes you don't need data if you're running you may not need the data from an individual transaction if you're running a smart contract and vice versa. There's information going on in different realms of Cardano and you're not necessarily, it's kind of a waste to know everything when you don't want to know everything. It's computationally expensive and may just slow down the blockchain over time. So what Rick was bringing up was the different wallets. And obviously Sebastian said before that he works for Emergo, so he has to keep um, he has to watch what he says about certain wallets. But the Daedalus wallet, for all of those who don't think that Cardano has a working product, is Cardano's working product. It is the official Cardano wallet. You can go on DaedalusWallet.io and it communicates with the blockchain. So obviously you can see from the screen that uh, Rick has some ADA loaded up onto the Daedalus wallet, and this is part of the settlement layer. So he can receive ADA, he could send ADA, and that address that he has pulled up is going to give him the history of his transactions within this ecosystem. So I could send Rick five ADA right now, and it would show up shortly after in his Daedalus wallet. And this is the official full, this is like a full client or a full wallet. It is processing the entire blockchain. So for those who think that the Daedalus wallet sinks slow, it's because it's processing a lot of transactions, the entire history of the blockchain. But over time, new iterations of Daedalus are going to increase the speed that it takes to sync blocks and basically connect with the blockchain. But for those who are having trouble with Daedalus, they having, they're, they're waiting a long time or they don't have the patience to wait for blocks or maybe they have an old computer or whatever, the minority of people that have, are having issues with Daedalus, they can download a light client. And the main light client, the number one light client is Yodoi. And it was created by Emergo. And basically, it is a Google Chrome extension. So it's not running the entire... It's, it's not as computationally expensive as Daedalus. So as long as you can open up a Chrome tab on your Google, you can communicate with the blockchain. And it is a super light client, so it does communicate with the main blockchain and update the main blockchain. But at the same time, you can use it in a more portable fashion and b b increase the speed, increase decrease the barrier to entry to you to participate within cardano so um i remember rick was saying a couple episodes ago that he was speaking with ruslan and he was saying that you can pull it up on yandex certain browsers on your phone so you can really use your phone now if you know how to navigate through yandex to send transactions and participate within yoroi but you know you can't obviously do that with Daedalus at the moment. But Yodoi is the light version, and Infinito is the Infinito wallet is another derivation of that. So Rick, I don't know if you wanted to take it from here, or Sebastian, you you felt like you needed to say anything from Emergo's side. Yeah, let me hit on a few more points here uh, as it relates to the different types of wallets. Okay, so the first one I had up here, Daedalus. All right. When you install and run Daedalus Wallet, you're actually participating in the protocol. It's a full node. Now, I could pull up processes on here, but I won't do that on this channel. Um, I do it on Digital Fortress where I can edit the security things out of the video. But um, when you run Daedalus, uh, you're running the back end and the front end, but it is the uh, settlement layer. And you can conduct transactions. So the settlement layer, layer is the wallet, and it's how you transfer of value from person to person. The compute layer is the smart contract layer, and it takes care of a lot of the computations. There's a lot of things that can go into the compute layer. Uh, it's I think it's relatively infinite. Um, run some very fancy code on that level. Uh, but the settlement layer is the wallets, and there's different types of wallets. There's thick wallets or heavy clients. There's different words for it. Daedalus is a heavy node it's a full node it's a full node wallet okay that's shown there so when you run it you're actually you're providing uh support to the protocol 
in the transactions. Currently, not really because it's still centralized as of December 2018, but once it decentralizes, it'll work like the Ethereum nodes and the Ethereum Classic nodes and all the other nodes where uh, it's actually going to process transactions and participate in the protocol. Not as a miner, but as a wallet, like Emerald Wallet for Ethereum Classic and the Mist Wallet for Ethereum. Those are actually full nodes, same as Daedalus. It's a full node wallet, and it takes care of transactions. Uh, the other types of wallets, I've got one on my phone. Okay, It's a light client. It runs as an app. It does not run in a specific web browser. It might use web browser-like technologies. Some of them do, some of them don't. Okay, so there's two different types. You got the cell phone, which is like the uh, very lightweight version. You got the full node Daedalus. I've got two others here, Yoroi. Now Yoroi is a plugin. So there's actually processing, computation, and private keys stored inside the uh, Chrome web browser uh, with Yoroi. And let, if I get that wrong, Sebastian, correct me, but it does store your, your private keys in a secure environment and it's been security checked. We touched on that on episode two uh, with uh, Nicolas. Um, he talked about that. And uh, the Ada Lite wallet. Now, the Ada Lite wallet, I don't completely understand the technology, but it runs entirely inside the web browser. So to pull it up, I did not have to install a plugin uh, to launch it. You could go to the web page and you can put in a, 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 a 12-word seed or you can put in a private key. You can enter that in a web browser. Some people don't like doing that for security purposes, but the nice thing about the Ada Light Wallet is it interfaces with the Trezor. So if you, if I were to plug in a Trezor and launch, the, there's another option here on Ada Light uh, when you log in. Uh, you could select Hardware Wallet, and then you connect the Trezor, and that way the private key stays on there and it communicates. But this is probably one of the lightest clients where it's, contained entirely in the web browser, no plugin. And uh, when you close it, when you close out the web browser, basically all the information that was cached in there kind of uh, disappears or something, something happens to it. But it's completely gone until you go back to the website. So there's uh, there are four basic types, full node, you got plugins, you got the, they run entirely inside the web browser, and you got ones that run on mobile devices. Uh, and that takes that's that covers your settlement layer kind of stuff. Anything about the contract layer or the, the compute layer? I, I said it wrong. CL stands for the compute layer. Uh, did I cover the settlement layer pretty good? And any comments on the compute layer? Anything that should be added to that for the how does it help your grandma buy groceries at the grocery store? <laughs> yeah, if I can say so, the way it would work in the future is the settlement layer is where you store all your money. The settlement, is where is, the settlement layer is where you would stake and all this kind of stuff. The competition layer will be accessible through your wallet, but it'd be kind of a layer that you only interact with when you need to, right? So if you see some dApp running on Cardano you want to interact with, you send as much money as you need to to your competition layer, like a sub-wallet, I guess, and then interact with the smart contracts and then when you're done, if you have any ADA left over, you send it back to the settlement layer. So that's kind of how it would work in theory. So when you'd open up your wallet, like Daedalus or Yoroi, it would open up with the settlement layer, right? And you'd have some sort of portal inside the wallet where you can convert your ADA to computation layer ADA. And once you've converted your ADA to computation layer ADA, then you can interact with smart contracts and then when you're done, you could come back. So that's kind of how it'll work in, in a high level. Okay, so that kind of explains where, if uh, there's some really good videos from IOHK, if you want to see how that works, where if you're going from what's running on the settlement layer goes to the computation layer, some work in some way gets done and then passed back, there's uh, a lot of really good videos that explain greater detail of how that works. Um, yeah, we could easily have an entire episode on that topic. Yeah. So, Do you have yes. one? I thought you had one on that too. Yeah, I have a video on a paper I just came made which proves how you could go between the counting model and a UTXO model and then back. Okay, so that's on so, your Sebastian Guillermo channel and uh, yeah. we'll have that link down below. So if people want to yeah. see more on that video, more details, 
uh, make sure you go to that. We are getting close to the end of the program for today. I don't want to be a time miser, but I'm going to hit the latest news in Cardano. Okay. That was another user feedback that I got from people, so I'm going to touch on that real quick. Uh, a few things we mentioned during the episode. Uh, two recent papers that came out, the parallel chains improving throughput through latency. Very good paper. Uh, you can find that on the IOHK website under research, under research papers. Um, the Ouroboros Crypsinus, privacy preserving proof of stake. Uh, and Plutus Fest is coming up December 11th. So by the time this video is released, uh, Plutus Fest will be very near. Uh, we're all going to it, myself, Sebastian, Philippe, we're all going to Plutus Fest, and uh, Philippe and I plan on running some video from there. We're not exactly sure how that's going to work out right now, but we'll figure it out. Uh, we'll figure something out when we get there. Um, and also, you know, a, a wise man once told me that you don't need to know how a nuclear reactor operates to use a light switch. So we tried to cover in this episode uh, how does Cardano apply to you? What does it look like to the beginner, the new user, um, and stuff like that? Uh, and one other thing I wanted to touch on was a point of criticism uh, that people bring up, and that is Cardano 1.4. Uh, there's Cardano 1.4 a few months ago was touted as being released by the end of November or sometime in November, and the deadlines creep back. You know, deadlines get pushed back. That happens where I work. It happens everywhere. Uh, you try to release a product at a certain time, and it doesn't quite get there. And the last I heard on Cardano 1.4 is that it was entering the QA process. That was somewhere earlier in November. Now it's December 1st. Cardano 1.4 is not out yet. So if you're still curious about when that's coming out, feel free to reach out to us on Telegram. And maybe somebody will have an answer. Keep an eye on Twitter, uh, the social media outlets. You'll get faster updates than the Roadmap website. The Roadmap website is kind of like the big picture. The social media outlets is where you can find out when the next release is coming out. So uh, that's all I had for the latest news in Cardano was recent papers released, update coming soon. Plutus Fast is scheduled for December 11th. Okay, anything else? Otherwise, Philippe, let's wrap us up, sir. Rick, great job. Um, thank you to the Reddit user that suggested the, the news brief at the end. I think that was very helpful. And like Rick was saying, you know, things come, some things get delayed. It's, it's fine to be critical, but understand that processes are in place and people are working. And it's better that the correct product comes out the first time than a rushed, incomplete product comes out. And we all, we all face the, the consequences of that. So um, that being said, keep on reaching out to us via email or on Reddit or on Telegram, Twitter. Uh, we appreciate all the support, the likes, the comments, and the, sub the subscriptions to our YouTube channel. This channel is growing out of control. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks for all the feedback and the help for the live AMA episode last week with Charles. Uh, the, the feedback is great. And one more point that I wanted to touch. This was a quick um, – this was a – a more entry level episode today so for all of those who are super high level and want to lambast us for for basically providing the information in a much more consumable format you have to understand that cardano is looking to migrate millions of people on their platform so if you want highly technical videos they're coming we have all stars coming on our podcast we have an all-star every day every time we start this podcast we have an all-star sebastian's an all-star um you know we're gonna get the the professors and we're, we're reaching out we have a stacked calendar so be patient with us and remember that not everyone may be as high level as you or may not have as much experience in crypto as you you know at the end of the day you have to take it step by step by step. And, um, you know, it's important to know a rudimentary understanding of how the protocol works, but it's not necessary for everyone to be a master at computer engineering or, or software engineering to understand how this works. This process is going to continue and we need to migrate as many people as possible. If you're a trader, you're an investor, or you just see the long-term growth in the company, you need to understand that 
it's important to bring in everyone, everyone. So if you have a technical approach, release YouTube videos, release a blog. We will be supporting. You know, everyone can contribute. Everyone's going to have some sort of gripes, but figure out that these episodes are for everyone and do not feel excluded because we're not trying to build a super niche community here. We're trying to build a grand community that can include as many people as possible. We we try to, you know, if we, we keep it level 100 all the time, we're just going to build a super high level 100, level 100 niche community for the rest of the time. We're not going to integrate any other person within this community. Everyone's going to feel like, oh, I can't, I have to stay away from this super high academic peer reviewed project. We're trying to break it down in the best way possible. So that completes my rant. Sorry for ranting so much, but um, this completes the episode. And thank you again for joining us for the special episode of the Cardano Effect podcast. Great things coming soon. And until next time, bye everyone.